Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds. My name is Tom Farden. I'm the chair and organizer of Grand Rounds. And today, my input here is very brief. Um, I'm just here to, uh, to welcome you all and to welcome particularly Professor Ronald Hodden, who joins us uh, for, the, uh, for his own awards, the Ronald Hodden Awards, which have been running for a couple of years now. And we're um, privileged to host these at Grand Rounds, uh, thanks to the organizational skills of Kevin McConville. Um, who coordinates these. Um, he'll explain in more detail what this is about, uh, but for the last couple of years, we've been uh, in the position to listen to our amazing medical students who have undertaken the medical education intercalated year. And as part of that year, they, they do a, a body of work which they submit. It, the 13 students are whittled down to the best three, and they then get the opportunity to present to the Grand Rounds audience and to Professor Harden himself, uh, and then there is some voting to see who wins wins the prize. The standards of these presentations is, is excellent, uh, I think is a testimony to the, to the students themselves, obviously, but also the quality of teaching that goes on here uh, in medical education in Dundee, which obviously Professor Harden was the, uh, the, the godfather of it all, and it all continues uh, in his legacy. Um, so we're grateful for him being here, and I'm sure he'll have some some probing questions for the students and some comments at the end. So usual etiquette for Zoom applies. Please mute your microphone unless you're going to speak. Um, the chat is open throughout, so you can put in comments, questions, etc. Um, and there will be an opportunity to ask questions to the students directly. So I'll pass on to Kevin. I'm afraid I have to leave um, because I'm wanted elsewhere, but I'll be watching on YouTube later. Don't forget, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, subscribe, comment, click the wee bell so you get notifications. On on that, adieu. Kevin, thanks very much. Thank you. Um, thanks, Tom, for that as well. So I'm just going to pop a very couple of quick slides. Um, a reminder to particular clinicians in the audience, we are still recruiting um, for some OSCEs for next week. So if you have forgotten or have time, then um, we really still could do with your help within that. Um, so on that note, no, and thinking about, as Tom has already provided introductions, and um, the, where the OSCEs originally um, came from. Uh, I'm very delighted again to have Professor Harden with us today as we listen to three of our BMSE medical education students. These students are doing an intercalated degree, so they are in between third and fourth year in medicine. Um, the presentations that you're about to see, um, each will be a maximum of 10 minutes with a couple of minutes for questions. Um, and then I will pop up a link at the end for voting um, for your uh, most favorite one um, from today. The, the presentations are all drawn from their research dissertation work. Um, and as Thomas said, they, they really are of high quality, but the data collection is really a short period between around about um, end of December, January into about March before they have to draw a line under to write it up in time to submit for their degree. Um, so um, it, there's a little bit of background for you within that. So I, I'm going to, to stop and we're going to have three students um, who each are, um, should know they're going to be sharing their screen and we'll talk to their work. Um, but then about that, it was a really difficult choice for, for myself and my co-program leave Fiona Muir, um, who sends apologies and cannot be here today either to be able to, to make a decision, but these are the three that we would like you to, to listen to um, and learn from today. Um, so I'm just going to stop my scene sharing and I think hopefully Aaron, um, you will be first up. I know um, Aaron is you're just working your way through that Aaron is also very diligently on holiday somewhere in Florida, so coming zooming from us across the world. Um, okay, Aaron, I'll hand over to you. Hopefully you should be able to see a share screen option whenever you're ready. Yeah. Okay. Is that um, coming through now? I think it's just about, yes, we can see that in full screen. Over to you. Okay, brilliant. Um, so, hi, um, my name is Aaron, and my project was titled White Space and the Scott Gym Longitudinal Integrated Clerkship. Um, so this was my poster that I presented to my peers. I also presented an earlier version of this to the last NES conference. Um, so this presentation, I will just go through all the different elements of this poster in more detail. So my um, project was an exploration into the medical students' perceptions of utility of the self-directed component or white space 
of the longitudinal integrated clerkship in the Scott Gem curriculum. So just some background to explain all that. Um, Scott Gem is a relatively new accelerated four year graduate entry medical program tailored to generalist medicine. In year three of the Scott Gem program, students undertake a year long longitudinal integrated clerkship. In this, they are integrated into one general practice for two and a half days a week. The rest of their time is allocated to white space where they can undertake secondary care placements and portfolio work while directing their own learning. The LIC encourages students to proactively identify and seek their learning needs using the resources available to them. So to do this, I carried out a literature search. And so initially I did quite a narrow search to try and find out if there's any um, literature in that area. However, this, these yielded insufficient results. Therefore, I did a more broad search using the search terms listed below. And this is where that diagram fits in. So I used PubMed and University of Dundee Library Search to do this. And eventually this yielded 113 articles to review. So I noticed that there was a paucity of literature in this white space. Um, so um, there was also limited literature on Scott Gem and postgraduate based LICs. And then in addition, there were further calls for research into the optimal structure of LICs. So all these reasons combined were one of the main drivers for this study. So onto the project aims. This study's primary aim was to explore the students' perceptions of utility regarding the white space of the Scott Gem LIC. The secondary aims included to explore the positive aspects of this white space, to explore any challenges that students face in using this white space, and to explore any differences between the white space of the LICs in different regions. So onto my methodology. So this study used an explorative case study approach to uncover the students' perceptions of this white space during their LIC. It followed a constructivist paradigm as this incorporates numerous relative truths dependent on one's construction of reality. Semi-structured interviews were conducted with both third year students, so current LIC students, and fourth year students, so previous LIC students, um, to allow for triangulation of data to hopefully improve that data quality. 13 interviews were conducted and transcribed to allow for inductive thematic analysis to enable themes to be drawn from that data. So here is a, a map of Scotland with the four regions of the LEC. Um, so we've got Highlands, Tayside, Fife and Dumfries and Galloway. And next to it is a table with my participants and um, the distribution between third and fourth year. So in Highlands, I managed to gather six participants. In Tayside, sadly, I managed to gather um, none. And it seemed unethical to try and chase participants. Um, but uh, we concluded that it was OK in the end. And I'll explain that later. Um, so Fife, I gathered four participants. And the Freezer Galloway, I gathered three. And the distribution is shown on the table there. Here is just a map of all the GP the Scott Gym um, GP practices um, that I do the lick. Um, and this was provided by my supervisor, Dr. Lloyd Thompson. And this just demonstrates that some of the GP practices are a lot more rural compared to others. So onto my findings. So there were four main themes that were gathered from this. So the first theme was how students use this white space. And the sub-themes here were the flexibility in that white space, the self-direction aspect of the white space, and components that take up the white space time. The second theme was guiding students in using white space. So using secondary care placements was discussed and the importance of generalist clinical mentor groups was also discussed. Variations in experiences of the lit and the white space was another theme and differences between general practices were brought up and regional structural differences were also um, considered. Suggestions to improve the utility of white space was the last theme and the sub themes here were the optional structure or guidance for students, optional university wide teaching, and using others' experiences to inform new approaches. So, onto the discussion. So, the usage of white space. So, the flexibility of white space enables students to personalize their experience and learning outcomes, although this was seen as overwhelming for some students. And guiding students in using this white space. GCM groups or general clinical mentor groups um, allowed students to have a weekly follow up between their tutor and both their peers um, to allow sharing of experiences and tips on how to best utilize this white space, um, including trying to best organize secondary care placements. So secondary care placements help to direct students learning 
but these can seem uncoordinated and unproductive in some cases. Variations in experiences. So different geographical health board regions face differing logistical challenges when fitting with the ethos of the Scott GMLA. Suggestions to improve the utility of this white space. Optional guidance for students to follow, helping structure their white space and facilitate collaboration between the elected regions and between students can also help in increasing the utility of this white space, just allowing good practices to be put across the board. So to conclude, the white space is generally perceived as a useful, flexible aspect of the LIC. However, the utility of it does vary between both regions and the students. Secondary care placements and GCM groups can enhance the utility of this white space, but these were seen as inconsistent. Offering guidance for students, as well as enabling collaboration between students, may enhance the utilization of this white space. Furthermore, some recommendations for future practice. So these recommendations are for um, the curriculum leads and other educators responsible for the Scott Gem Lit. And these would be um, just suggestions for um, future practice. So the first suggestion was ensuring that white space remains a protected element um, where possible to allow students to benefit from the flexibility that it can provide. Another suggestion was to remain vigilant that some students may find it difficult to utilize this white space and therefore may benefit from additional support. Offering optional guidance for students and directing their learning within this white space, as well as guidance to use the secondary care placements could be really useful in making sure students are comfortable to meet their learning requirements. Using weekly or monthly themes to guide learning and implement occasional teaching of important topics could also be really useful. And finally, facilitating peer mentorship between the fourth and third year students to enable that transfer of experiences and ideas effectively um, to utilize to effectively utilize this white space. And here are some suggestions for future research. Um, so as this is a small scale study, a more thorough review of each region of the LEC could be useful in determining the students' consensus of this white space in those regions, and therefore better target some of the recommendations previously discussed. As the study discusses using GCM groups, so those generalist clinical mentor groups, and secondary care placements from the student's perspective, further research might consider if staff perceive that they are adequately guiding students and learning via both of these. As there were many conflicting perceptions of the utility of the white space, a study investigating why different students are better suited to a flexible, self-directed learning environment may be an important area to explore aiming to focus the interventions on those um, who need it most. So there were some limitations to the study. Um, as I, I'm a novice researcher and quite new to qualitative research, um, I used a reflective diary um, during my data collection um, phase. I was also supervised by an experienced supervisor who assisted in the thematic analysis. Um, the duration of the study was also a limitation as um, I only had a quarter of a year to do this. So um, I only managed to interview third year students once, well, well all students once. And um, so that meant that when interviewing third year students, um, they may have been unsure how useful that white space was as they may not have had formative assessments before um, and therefore may be unsure at what level um, or skill they were. So another limitation was recall bias. As I interviewed fourth years, as this was because they were several months out of the lick. And then another limitation described was the lack of volunteers from Tayside. However, as this project was aiming to establish the um, white space of, of the whole Scotch M lick generally, um, it seemed fine because that was just one narrow region. And therefore the general themes persist throughout or should hopefully persist throughout. And the limited participation could be seen as a limitation. However, some offers do argue that it's actually more important to have rich and meaningful data rather than um, numerous um, data sources. And here are the key references that I've used. So the first two references um, helped me establish my foundation in the, in the world of longitudinal integrated clerkships um, and helped with the research question um, of the white space. And the last reference there was just how I used, um, what I used to analyze my data. So um, that concludes my presentation. So thank you for listening and um, please ask me any questions.
Thank you, Aaron. We just have maybe one or two minutes for any questions from the audience. Could, could I, um, first of all, congratulate you on, a, I think, an excellent uh, presentation and a very good piece of work. I think you, you addressed really three very important topical issues in medical education at the moment. One, the notion of longitudinal clerkships, one, self-directed learning, and third, the changing role of students. So, uh, excellent. So, perhaps, could I, could I ask you, you were studying this approach in the context of longitudinal clerkship, do you think the same approach would work in the more traditional clinical teaching? And perhaps the second question, this experience that you've had or you've observed there, do you think is that going to encourage students to become more actively involved in the curriculum? Uh, the whole move to students much more as partners, which you're, you're pointing the way there. Do you think this will lead to this, this happening further? Um, so that's something I did consider, actually. So um, with regards to your first question, I guess it can fit into that traditional, um, the traditional clerkships, the sort of block rotations that we currently do, um, that are currently done. Um, um, however, there is a sort of, um, there's a difference here as, as this is with all postgraduate students in the sense that, um, so they have had a previous degree of some sort to develop their learning styles and, and to get used to how they can better learn themselves, in a sense. And then, um, so um, so it kind of, it could potentially transfer, but it might need more um, sort of nurturing in that sense. And then um, regarding your second question, um, um, sorry, could you remind me again? Sorry. It's, it's, do you think this will encourage the students to become more active involved in other part, other ways as partners in the education program and uh, as the changing role of students in education. So do you think this will be um, a, a move in that direction? Yeah, I, I would think so, um, because it does encourage students to proactively sort of seek their learning needs and therefore they can sort of, so um, one of the students described it as they could mold their experience um, by using the resources. So they could um, sort of, engage with their um like their tutors and other um experienced staff and trying to figure out what best suits them and therefore are quite engaged in um that curriculum aspect um i hope that addresses your question no, th th thank you thank you it does in fact i'm just publishing this coming month by elsevier a, a new book on the changing role of students and I think if I'd known about your study beforehand, I might have included that as a case study in it. So well, well done anyway, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Professor Harden. Um, and it sounds like that's good dream as well, Leverage, Aaron. I know you've been at the workshops recently as well, if I think about future publication within that. I can see a few um, questions as well about your work in the chat. So maybe I can leave you to answer some of those in the chat and we might have time at the end to pick up on it as people are voting, but I'm, I'm just mindful of people in time as well. So thank you very much. Um, and we're going to move on to the second presenter, and that's Catherine. Hello, can you Hi. hear me? Yes, Catherine. Amazing. Right, I'll just try share my screen. Yeah, you should have an option to share your screen. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Is that sharing yeah, something? Yeah, so we can see the posters appearing. Okay, let me just, is that on your screen? It is, yes. Amazing. And see if I zoom in, can you see that more? Yes. Okay, amazing. Um, okay, amazing. Uh, so thank you so much for having me here today. So um, my name's Catherine and I'm a BMSC medical education student. And my research was focused on Dundee medical students' preparedness to communicate with British Sign Language users in practice. And um, so the deaf community, in particular BSL users, face significant challenges when accessing healthcare. And this can result in underdiagnosis and undertreatment of conditions, um, ultimately leading to the deaf community's health being poorer than the general population. And a way to address these health inequalities is by increasing skills and awareness training for healthcare professionals, as there's currently a lack of such training within UK medical schools, including within Dundee. 
So within the uh, Dundee current curriculum, there's teaching within second and third year that serves as an introduction to disability, which briefly touches on deaf awareness and the titles of the sessions are just um, noted there. And there's also an optional sign language SSC student selected component in third year. Um, however, only 14 students are able to do this per year. And I was fortunate enough to be one of these students uh, to do this session in my third year. And this is what sparked my interest in this particular research area. In addition to this, there's a consulting through interpreters teaching session in fourth year, which gives students the opportunity to practice consulting with a patient through a foreign language interpreter, um, which the study further explored. So within the curriculum um, in these teaching sessions, there is still a lack of sufficient teaching for all students and working with BSL users and interpreters in practice, along with deaf awareness. And therefore my research aimed to look at how prepared Dundee medical students are in communicating with this patient group in practice, as well as how can uh, teaching be changed in order to reflect this. So for my study, um, an exploratory case study approach was used um, with semi-structured interviews with four staff members who currently teach the fourth year consulting through interpreters teaching session. And then I recruited seven fifth year medical students. And um, this allowed for triangulation of the data, which strengthened the study. After transcribing the data, it was interpreted by thematic analysis. And within my findings, three themes emerged um, with the different sub themes displayed here on my thematic map. So firstly, preparedness for practice. So th the sub themes for this were personal experience, deaf culture awareness, knowledge of learning and competency and performance. So in terms of Miller's pyramid of clinical competence with the diagram just there, so that's the knows, knows how, shows how and does. Through previous teaching and personal experiences, students demonstrated knowledge and skills at the lower levels of the pyramid. However, both students and staff recognised that the current curriculum did not adequately prepare students to independently work with um, BSL users and interpreters and therefore did not achieve the higher levels of the pyramid, which is more applicable to real life scenarios. So moving on to the second um, theme, which was demand for teaching. So the, the sub themes here were perceived value, perceived gaps in teaching and frequency of teaching. So with this uh, perceived gap in the curriculum, there was concern regarding students' current lack of experience. With some of the teaching they had received, despite being beneficial and applicable, it would not be brought forward into their career, uh, for example, some of the teaching in the earlier years. Therefore, there was widespread <coughs> enthusiasm to incorporate further undergraduate, sorry, <coughs> um, further undergraduate teaching on British Sign Language users and deaf awareness. However, what was also noted was that the current teaching um, students might not be taking responsibility for their learning and appreciating the transferability of it for future practice and therefore may prevent them from progressing as a doctor. And then the final theme was optimising learning. So this included stage of learning, perceived barriers, format of teaching, interpreter contribution and wider learning needs. Um, both participant cohorts emphasise that due to senior students having more established communication skills, that they're therefore better able to apply these to more complex scenarios. And so teaching um, within this area would be better suited and more beneficial in the later year groups. Challenges such as resource costs and limited curricular time were also acknowledged, with an emphasis on students needing to make the most of their current learning, for example, through reflection which is currently being done in the consulting through interpreter teaching session in fourth year. However, it is hoped that this research will encourage curriculum leads to consider this teaching on British Sign Language users and deaf awareness as a bit of a greater priority. The high standard of clinical skills teaching at Dundee um, incorporating experiential learning was seen as very beneficial for student learning and therefore implementing a new teaching session in this way, perhaps similar to the current consulting through interpreter teaching session would be optimal. Strengths and weaknesses of self-learning resources were also discussed and um, highlighting that these resources should aid in-person practical sessions rather than replacing it. So in conclusion, 
while students felt that they had gained some transferable skills within the current Dundee curriculum for working with BSL users and interpreters in practice, students did not feel adequately prepared to communicate with this patient group um, upon graduation. Henceforth, the incorporation of such a new teaching session would increase student confidence and be a beneficial addition to the Dundee Medical School curriculum. In terms of recommendations for this new teaching session, this session should be within the senior years, focusing on experiential learning, similar to the current consulting through interpreter session. As students um, said lots of positive things about this session and find that it worked really well and was a very enjoyable and beneficial part of the curriculum. Um, additionally, supplementary resources should aid the session, for example, pre and post reading, which from my findings should have a focus on deaf awareness and how to access interpreting services. And this would ensure that the in-person teaching session is as practical and experiential as possible due to the perceived limited curricular time. And then incorporation of BSL interpreters is also key um, as insight from these individuals would be invaluable to teaching, teaching session aims. And additionally, learning some basic sign language within the start of the teaching session may increase student engagement. In terms of future studies, how students can be empowered to take responsibility for their own learning and current teaching um, would be good to look into as this was raised by both staff and students uh, to be an issue. And then looking at exploring the experiences of Dundee graduates, as my study was just looking at fifth year medical student perceptions, however, less than half of the participants actually had encounters with BSL users. So it was hard to gauge whether they would actually be prepared and faced with the scenario for the first time. So being able to gather perceptions of Dundee graduates may uh, give a better insight into whether the curriculum adequately prepares them for their first encounter. And then exploring the possibility of delivering some of the BSL learning outcomes and objectives in the foundation programme or in postgraduate training, as I'm aware that learning does not conclude after graduation. So this would be good to look into a bit further. And then finally, incorporation of teaching on a wider scale, for example, within other UK medical schools, as the literature highlights that lack of teaching in this area is a UK wide problem. So that would be really good to look into. And then my references are just in the bottom right hand corner there. And um, yes, that's everything. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, and yeah, if you leave that up first, just wait to have a look at for a second. But I don't know if you have any, if we have questions from the audience? Perhaps I could jump in again and, 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 and ask again, congratulations both on an excellent study and a very good presentation. Just two, two quick questions. Obviously, one issue is to what extent do you think this should be incorporated um, as part of the core uh, the core curriculum for all students? Bit of it, just deaf awareness or sign language, or, or to what extent is this you see as a, an elective or option for some students to choose? So, what should be part of a core curriculum? And second, I just wondered in the students you studied, were there any difference in their characteristics or the, their background as to whether they benefited or wanted to take part in in this sort of experiment with you? Um, so just your first question, so the core curriculum. So um, at the consulting through interpreter session at the moment is in fourth year and within the study and with uh, both participants, participant cohorts, they kind of suggested that a session similar to this would be quite good to incorporate into the core curriculum as um, I did the student selected component in third year, which did cover a lot of this content, but only 14 students are able to do that. And that's why I'm quite passionate about bringing, being able to bring what I was taught for everyone, as I think it's really important. Um, so even one session on this would be very beneficial, I think, for students just within the core curriculum. Um, and then, sorry, what was your second question again? It was, which in your experience, were there some were there differences in how students responded to this, their different characteristics or background? The students. Or was there this uh, a uniform response to this you know, fascinating experience you, you you arranged? As in a new teaching, the response yep. to yes, yeah, so all of them were really enthusiastic, um, and a lot of them were actually very keen to learn some sign language, which I know is um, 
perhaps like you don't need to learn sign language to speak with an interpreter but that's why incorporating something like that would be quite good um but the engagement from both staff and students was really positive and i think from the literature and from what they were saying um student engagement and teacher engagement actually increases the how beneficial a teaching session is so therefore highlights that it probably would be quite beneficial for them <laughs> thank you thank you catherine um, and again there's some comments kind of in the chat at the side of that that might be worthwhile kind of can get you to answer or to to ha have a little look at within that great thank, thank you. you so much Okay, um, and so our third presenter um, is Katie. Hi there, good afternoon everyone. Can I just check that you can hear me all right? Yeah. Perfect, I'll just share my screen now. Okay, um, that should be it. Brilliant, um, I'll just set my timer so that I won't go over the limit. Um, brilliant, so um, good afternoon everyone. My name's Katie. Katie um, and my research project was entitled Student and Educator Experiences of a Student-Led Clinic in General Practice. So the transition from being a medical student to working as a doctor can be quite challenging um, and it's been suggested that students should be given clinical experience and responsibility during medical school to help prepare them for this transition um, and student-led clinics or SLCs may have the potential to facilitate this. Um, within SLCs, students take the lead role in delivering patient care with support and supervision being provided by healthcare professionals and a general practice SLC was established at Newfield Medical Centre in Dundee. So just to give you a bit of background on how this student-led clinic was run, um, the SLC was part of a four-week placement for groups of four final year medical students um, at Dundee. Um, so four students and one supervising GP were involved in this clinic um, and clinics take place within a purpose-built student hub. Um, so when patients who are registered with the main GP practice attached to the hub um, phone to make an appointment, they might be offered an appointment in the student-led clinic if their case is deemed appropriate for a final year medical student. Um, and this is done through a telephone vetting process, which is done by a GP. Um, so within the SLC, students have a variety of roles. Um, they perform consultations independently, which involves taking history and performing physical examinations. They then discuss the differential diagnosis and management plan with the GP that's supervising them. The student and the GP then go back and see the patient together, at which point the GP decides if any treatment or referral is necessary. Um, and then the student's encouraged to carry out any tasks which arise from the patient encounter. So that could be things like ECGs or taking bloods. Um, appointments are staggered by 15 minutes, and this was designed to give the supervising GP time to see each student and their patient before the next student them, and each student sees three patients per clinic. So here's the reception area of the student hub. This is where the GP is based during the clinics. Um, this is the patient waiting area. These are the six consulting rooms, so each student has their own consulting room. Um, and then this is the staff room that the students and staff can use. Um, so the aim of this research was to explore students and educators' experiences and perceptions of this SLC. Um, and the three research questions were, what are students and educators' perceptions of their learning and teaching experiences within the SLC? Which factors contribute to these experiences and perceptions? And what are the areas of strength and areas for development of this SLC? So just to talk about the methodology, um, this was an exploratory case study um, and the case was bounded in terms of the location, the participants and the time frame. So the location was the student led clinic in the student hub at Newfield Medical Centre. The participants were the final year medical students who took part in the clinic um, and the GPs who supervised them. And the time frame was January to March 2023. Um, data were collected using semi-structured interviews and observation um, and participants were recruited via email. So 11 students and three educators were interviewed and 18 hours of observation were conducted over six clinics. Um, these interviews were recorded and transcribed verbatim um, and detailed field notes were taken during the observations. Then these transcripts and field notes were integrated and thematically analysed in line with Brown and Clark's guidance um, and data saturation was reached with students but not with educators. So I aim to enhance trustworthiness in three ways. Um, firstly, through triangulation. So that was method triangulation using interviews and observation and data source triangulation. So using multiple students and multiple educators across multiple cohorts of students. 
Secondly, um, keeping a reflexive diary allowed me to become aware of and address my own biases and assumptions. And finally, um, through member checking. So all participants who had consented to being contacted about member checking were emailed a summary of my findings. Um, unfortunately, only one educator and one student responded, but they both verified my findings. So five main themes, um, each with their own sub-themes were identified, and I'll just talk through them individually. So the first was the value of student responsibility. Um, so educators emphasised that students took the lead role in patient care, um, and educators felt this is a key factor in students' development. Um, overwhelmingly, students reported enjoying the responsibility of seeing patients and managing consultations without direct supervision, um, and they appreciated the feelings of autonomy and patient ownership that this fostered. Moreover, students' practical experiences of caring for patients enhanced their confidence, making them feel better prepared to become junior doctors. And students also felt that dealing with undifferentiated patients helped them develop their information gathering and clinical reasoning skills. The second theme was comfort with student responsibility. So four key factors were found to play a role in ensuring that both students and educators felt comfortable with students having this level of responsibility. Um, firstly, the students were in their final year of medical school, um, and this gave educators confidence that they could carry out their tasks without direct supervision or that they would ask for help when they needed it. And students felt well equipped for and actually wanted this level of responsibility. Secondly, within the student-led clinic, the GPs only role was to supervise the students, and this enabled them to manage multiple students at once, um, and it also encouraged students to seek help because they knew that the GP wasn't busy with other work and they wouldn't be interrupting them. Um, thirdly, educators ensured patient safety by asking additional questions, verifying students' examination findings, um, and checking students' written work, such as patient notes and referral letters. Um, this was reassuring for both students and educators. Um, and the GPs also created an open and supportive learning environment in which the students felt comfortable in admitting when they needed help. Um, indeed, feeling both independent and supported was highlighted as the major benefit of the SLC for students because they got to act like doctors, but they also had that safety net. And the fourth and final factor was appointment length. So one hour is allocated for each patient, despite each consultation typically lasting only 15 to 20 minutes. Um, both students and educators valued having this extra time as they could work, as they could generally work without feeling rushed, and it enables students to prepare for each consultation. The next theme is learning and teaching. So all three educators said that they enjoyed teaching within the student-led clinic. Um, they, saw, they saw it as straightforward and they viewed it as an extension of their normal teaching during traditional GP placements. Um, within this SLC, teaching was delivered in two main ways. So this was during individual discussions um, with students after they'd seen each patient and during debriefs, which happened after all the patients had left. So for individual discussions, after seeing each patient, the student presents the case um, and the GP might interject or ask questions at the end to kind of seek additional information or some clarification. Educators felt that this aided them in their own clinical reasoning processes and it reassured students that all of the necessary information had been gathered. Um, and when discussing the diagnosis and management plan, the educator would encourage students to think through things for themselves instead of just giving them the answer, um, which students find helpful. And students also liked the fact that this teaching was kind of personalised to them and it was delivered during the clinic itself because they could apply what they had learned immediately. Um, debriefs take place at the end of the clinic once students have seen all their patients um, and they provide an opportunity for students and educators to discuss cases further, clarify any confusion. Um, and these debriefs can be done individually or as a whole group. Um, so both students and educators preferred group debriefs um, as they allowed students to learn from each other's cases and they enabled educators to highlight important learning points from, to everyone in the group. The fourth theme is sense of purpose and belonging. Um, educators expressed a real enthusiasm for teaching and they really perceived the students' contributions as valuable. This really motivated the students um, and made them feel like part of the team. Students also found it useful to seek advice and learn from their peers um, and working alongside and socialising with their fellow students really contributed to their sense of belonging. Um, and finally, they also valued having their own physical space to work in within the student hub. And the fifth and final theme is time management challenges. Um, so despite one hour being allocated for each patient, um, the SLC sometimes ran behind schedule if cases were unexpectedly complex or if individual discussions were lengthy. Um, despite the vetting process that I mentioned earlier, um, some patients kind of slipped through the net um, and these complex consultations ended up taking longer. Um, this could disrupt the flow of the clinic um, despite the staggered appointments um, as multiple students end up requiring the GP at the same time, which could be quite stressful for the GP. 
Um, furthermore, if the individual discussions were too lengthy, um, the clinic could run behind schedule, um, making some students feel anxious about making their patients wait and potentially wasting some of the students' time. So overall, the findings reveal that students and educators had extremely positive perceptions of their learning and teaching experiences within the SLC. Students thrived as a result of their lead role in patient care, gaining a sense of empowerment, a patient ownership, and developing confidence in clinical skills, and they described feeling more prepared to become junior doctors. Their level of experience and the supportive environment fostered by the educators enabled students to fully engage in their roles. Educators also enjoyed working within the SLC as they were able to focus on the students and found it rewarding to see their development. Students stayed with training and willingness to seek support reassured the educators about giving them this level of responsibility. Aside from these areas of strength, it's also important to consider the challenge of time management. So my recommendations for future practice are to continue to give students responsibility and independence and maintain the supportive learning environment described, develop the patient vetting process, and encourage educators to ensure that these individual discussions aren't too lengthy. In terms of future research, it would be useful to objectively and quantitatively measure the development of students' skills, knowledge, confidence and preparedness for practice after participating in the SLC. Um, it would also be good to explore more educators' experiences given this, given this study's small educator sample size um, and exploring patients' experiences and perceptions would also be valuable. Um, and just to kind of finish on the impact of these findings. So these findings contribute to limited evidence relating to SLCs within the UK. And um, this has only been explored in one previous study. And um, the findings also suggest that the SLC is a viable alternative to traditional GP placement and could increase capacity because only one GP is required for multiple students. And finally, it suggests that giving students responsibility for real patients during medical school is both feasible and beneficial. Thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, Ron Hart, again, could I again congratulate you on an excellent uh, presentation and a very important uh, and uh, topical topic. Um, as I mentioned, very much students taking more responsibility as partners in the learning programme. This is an excellent example of that. Perhaps two quick questions. Uh, uh, for very good reason, I think you, you, uh, you, it involves final year medical students. Uh, one other published paper uh, introduced also earlier year students, and they found that peer teaching, it was a very good context for peer teaching. Now, I know that presents problems, but just any wonders, any thoughts on that? And, and, and secondly, if you to give one uh, quick reason why this should this approach should continue or be extended, what would be one reason to the faculty or to the dean why this approach should be continued? Yeah, so both excellent questions. Um, yeah, the peer teaching thing did come up a lot in my literature review and um, student-led clinics have been run with kind of junior medical students before and they've they've had a fantastic experience. Um, however, in a lot of those studies, um, educators haven't been involved. Um, so I think from my study, the findings might suggest that although maybe the stage of training doesn't matter so much for the students, educators might prefer students to be a little bit more experienced. Obviously, we would need further studies to kind of really evaluate this, but um, based on my findings, it appears that, you know, having students with five years of experience made the educators feel a lot more comfortable with it. Um, and then, sorry, what was the second question again? Oh, is it just the one thing that, yeah, I should tell them. Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Obviously, the... the Your the ele elevator pitch, if you do, you know, one yeah. quick reason why, uh, what this excellent work you report, why should this be continued? Yeah, absolutely. So the main thing that all of the students mentioned was the fact that they loved having the complete independence and responsibility. They loved bringing the patient in from the waiting room. They loved taking the history. They loved managing their own consultations. And they also really appreciated having that safety net. It was the perfect balance of being able to act like the doctor, but not having the responsibility of being the doctor. Um, and all of them were surprised by how much they enjoyed their experience. They thought it was absolutely fantastic overall. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. I'm just going to share my screen again as we finish kind of off. So just um, whilst we're waiting for a moment or two, I have popped into the chat the link um, for everyone so that you can make that difficult decision for us for voting or if this behaves itself. Um, it's going to appear as well here. So either way, the QR code within it. Um, I, 
I know that we have an audience, so I don't want to particularly put you in the spot, but I know we've also got our external examiner. Um, I don't know if um, Fiona, you want to make a kind of couple of comments whilst we give people um, just a little chance to vote. I was really good to be part of this, Kevin, and thank you to the three of you who presented. It's always lovely to find out what you were curious about and what you wanted to explore further. So I get the privilege to read your dissertations and will enjoy them having had these presentations, um, being able to be part of them. Um, I know your time limit was really, really tough. Um, so I congratulate you on being able to manage that time limit and to be able to offer us something that adds to our understanding of what works and maybe what doesn't work so well in medical education. So thank you very much. And hopefully I'll get to meet you in a couple of weeks time when I'm up in Dundee. So thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Um, and Professor Harden, I don't know if you, there's anything you just want to add to that, and then I'll stop sharing and go and see what's happening with the votes at the same time. <laughs> no, I, if I can just re reinforce my comments, I think these are excellent things to think they were done in such short period of times. And I think they were all hitting major topical issues. I mean, you could run a whole course on medical education using these as examples. So I think these are hitting very topical issues. And in particular, this the role of the students in the education program. And I think you showed great examples where we're trying to promote much more the student as a partner in the education, not just as a consumer or a client. And I think we've seen three great examples, both of the people themselves and what they've done advocating for this notion of moving much more up the ladder where students will become very active partners in the education program in all sorts of different ways. So congratulations. Thank you for that. Um, so as um, we've been talking there, um, thank you all very much for your kind of contributions, both um, to the students um, and also for the audience in the time. Um, I have been keeping an eye on the voting in between um, within that. Um, and it's always a really difficult decision to make, which is where it's easier to hand it to the audience to help us within that. Um, so I do need to know a, a slight conflict of interest in that I have co-supervised with one of the presidents, and that's Katie, um, within that, but I will get uh, Fiona to double check the marking at the back end of the, the survey as well, just to be able to validate. Um, but um, with great pleasure, I'm able to say that the winner of the Professor Harden BMSC MedEd Award um, is Katie Leslie um, for 2023. So well done to you, Katie Leslie. Um, in terms of um, a kind of awards and presentations, um, there will be an event later on in the next academic school year. Um, so hopefully we will catch up then if I don't see you in between um, within that virtually. Um, all that I think it leaves me for me to say is thank you all very much for your time and contributions today. Um, I know that Tom would want me to say that um, uh, if you've missed some of this or want to capture this or other um, a grand rounds, then you can find us all on um, YouTube where you can watch that and he will um, soon edit this and pop it up as well. Um, I understand that next week we have um, Rodney Mountain who will be talking um, to us um, about some of his ongoing work that he's developing as well within kind of med school within it. Um, so thank you all so much for your time, um, energy, efforts and attention this afternoon. Um, and I shall leave you to return to the rest of your day. I hope it's a very good one. Thank you.